all again for attending the 2021 Military History and Armed Forces Symposium at Discovery Park of America. This unfortunately will be the last program that we will have here on the main stage, uh, but we have saved the best for last. Uh, we have a gentleman here who needs absolutely no introduction, a dear friend of Discovery Park and a dear friend to all of us here in West Tennessee, uh, Lieutenant General John Glad Castlaw. <clears throat> well, it's great to see uh, some familiar faces uh, out there in the crowd. Appreciate you being here. Uh, the best thing right now is I'm not going to have to uh, compete with a helicopter. <laughs> you know, uh, as my fellow Marines know, we have a saying, I'm a Marine aviator, if you've got time to spare, fly Marine Air. And I guess it applies to National Guard Air as well. Let me take a little uh, time to deviate from my script and talk a little bit about uh, Discovery Park. Uh, I hope that you've had the opportunity uh, to look around, see the exhibits, talk to some of the folks that are here, and participate in some of the activities going on. You may not realize it, but Discovery Park plays a key role in our national security. Now, why would I say that? Well, some of you have heard me talk before, and in some of my remarks, I always cite a terrible statistic. And that terrible statistic is 70%, 70 percent, 70 percent of the 17 to 24 year olds in this great nation of ours cannot meet the requirements to join the military. And the reasons are they can't pass the physical, they have a record that prevents them from joining or they can't pass the test education-wise. And so what we need is institutions like this, organizations that are dedicated to inspiring our youth to generate their curiosity and technology to have STEM and STEAM programs that support that curiosity so that we can do something about that terrible statistic. And why is it important to have it here in Union City, Tennessee, in West Tennessee? Some estimates say that 40% 40% of the U.S. military comes from the 16 percent that's in rural America. And what that means to us is we want as many of our men and women as we can to go into the military to get additional training, to have the honor of serving our great nation, and then come back to Union City and Alamo and Dixon and Greenfield and be a part of the community. To bring that leadership skill, to bring that additional education, to bring that additional technology uh, that they were able to acquire in the military back to us where they can be members of the church board, they can be run for mayor and alderman in the community, that can help build rural America. And that's why when you look at it, serving in our nation's military, coming back to strengthen the community and the economy, that's the role that Discovery Park plays. And I, I'd like to have Nathaniel, you, 
have your people uh, stand up if they're not already. Raise your hands, and I want you to give them a big round of applause for what they've done in putting this together this weekend. <laughs> Been absolutely marvelous. So you talk about a military operation. Nathaniel has really learned what a military operation is this weekend, putting it together. Uh, but again, you know, I, I, I'm proud to be a Tennessean. Uh, you know, I, I went to UT Martin, and I see the uh, former chancellor there, and, uh, you know, I think there's even Jackie Gullett back there, you know, one of my AGR brothers. Always glad to see you. Uh, and, uh, you know, I started out in, uh, in the military there. You had, back then, you had uh, mandatory ROTC, uh, Tennessee. Martin was classified as a land-grant university. And then some of you were here yesterday when uh, uh, you heard uh, about, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bill Powell, uh, who was uh, wounded in Vietnam, was part of the Vietnam panel, you know, talk about walking on uh, the football field uh, to, as a walk-on for playing football. Uh, well, I, I did that for basketball. I walked on and, and uh, made the uh, freshman squad. And uh, I had a buddy, and uh, he said, hey, Glad, I said, uh, you know, I know you're doing ROTC, all of us have to, but you know the Marines have got this great deal. He said, you know, they'll pay you 100 bucks a month while you're in school, and then uh, you don't have to do this ROTC stuff. And then you have a summer job uh, when you get out of your first year. And so I said, that sounded pretty good to me, especially the 100 bucks. That was back in 1968 or 9 or somewhere along there. And so I, I signed up, and I went. Uh, and, of course, summer job was uh, OCS, uh, which was also boot camp. And uh, so uh, it's pretty tough, you know. So I got back, and uh, I met my buddy you know, on, the, on the ball team, and by that time, the Coach Shore said, hey, Castello, you know, I think that you'd do better in, in football, so we'll see you around. But my buddy said, uh, said, do you know what they did to me? I said, well, I know what they did to me. He said, I quit, but I enjoyed it and, and stayed with it. And, and uh, it was good to see these National Guardsmen here talk about their experiences and how good they are. And, and you know, like what comes out is sort of a, a uh, appreciation and a and an honor of serving, and you feel pretty good about it. And I got to tell you one more story. Uh, I was commanding general of the Second Marine Aircraft Wing at Cherry Point, North Carolina, and one day I got a phone call and said, "Hey, the President of the United States is coming down, and and since you weren't smart enough to figure out, and this was during uh, the invasion of Iraq, to get to war, you're going to have to host him because you're you know you're the senior guy and." Everybody else got to war. So President Bush comes down, and, and uh, Marine One lands. Uh, we did it at Camp Lejeune. And I wanted my wife is there with me, and uh, so we welcomed the president there. And uh, what we did was we had various locations around uh, Camp Lejeune where we uh, uh, had the president visit. One of them was the mess hall. We put a bunch of Texas Marines and sailors around him, and. And he, he goes into the mess hall, and he'd ask me to ride in a limousine with him. You know, and a limousine is, you know, about from here to the end of the building back there. And it was bench seats. Uh, I was sitting in the front seat, but it was turned toward him. He was looking forward, he and the first lady. And so, uh, you know, he was talking about, we just got out of the mess hall with the Marines and sailors, and he said, you know, that Marine from Amarillo, what a great Texan he was, and I really enjoyed talking with him, and that sailor uh, from Texacana, what a great Texan it was, and, you know, and he just kept on getting a little louder and faster, and finally he ran out of breath, <laughs> and I saw my chance, and again, you know, I, I'm a proud Tennessean. I said, Mr. President, he looked at me and called me by my first name. He said, what, General? <laughs> I said, Mr. President, if you Texicans had done a good a job of holding your part of the wall at the Alamo as the 26 Tennesseans did, 
Texas history had been different. <laughs> Six months later, I was in the desert. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, national security in the age of climate change, but I'm going to take a little path to get there, and I want to talk a little bit about where we where we've been, you know. Uh, most of us old folks that are around here, you know, uh, we were brought up in the uh, Cold War era. And what it was about was us against the Soviets, and we had some deviations from that, Vietnam, uh, Korea, and some other things, but really it was about looking eyeball to eyeball against them and competing with them around the world. And I tell you, there's no better symbol of that competition than if you look out the window here and you see that missile out there. That's a Titan I. There used to be a field of ICBMs, Titan Ones and then Titan Twos, 18 silos 200 miles from here in Arkansas. And they were spread Conway north and east a little bit. And uh, anybody ever heard of Damascus, Arkansas? Then you know what I'm talking about. You know, it, it, it's an example of how dangerous that particular area was. Uh, 1980, two Air Force guys were doing maintenance on one of those Titan IIs at the Damascus site. One of them dropped a nine pound uh, socket and the, the missiles were fuel, liquid fueled. You had a uh, oxidizer and then you had a, another highly volatile fluid and when you launched them, you put them together and it goes boom, okay. Hopefully pushes it out. Well, when that happened, the uh, oxidizer came out and eventually uh, the silo blew up. And it blew a 740 pound cover off of the silo and the warhead out. Uh, fortunately, of course, you know, the, the safeties didn't allow it to, to go. But that's an indicator of, you know, what we were living with then. And we had over in Blyville Air Force Base, you had B 52s that were on strip alert, ready to launch to carry nuclear weapons to downtown. Uh, Moscow. Even I, you know, I, 46 helicopter pilot in the Mediterranean, I'd haul nuclear weapons around in the back of my aircraft. And it was all that tension built up and eventually, you know, I got to, I got to uh, Stuttgart, Germany in the U.S. European Command, uh, 1990, 1991, and something happened that we had dreamed about all of our lives and that was the Soviet Union disintegrated. The wall came down. And I spent about six or eight months pulling medical and food supplies out of U.S. stocks, putting them on airplanes, and sending them to the former Soviet Union. The most ironic one was I was pulling it out of the Berlin stockpiles we were putting in for the next blockade. That was the end of the Cold War. And we thought, hey, you know, things are really looking up. We won. And so we sort of let our guard down for a little while, you know. We celebrated the, the victory in Iraq, uh, but things were still bubbling, and then we had 9-11. You know, we thought that that uh, peace was at hand, but it isn't. And we've been for 20 years in the U.S. global, or the global war on terror, terrorism. But I gotta tell you, we're at another one of those points that we were in uh, the 90s, early 1990s. We're, the post-Cold War era is ending. Uh, what we're seeing is a return to what's more normal which is a peer competitor, and that's China. 
building economically, building militarily, uh, confronting us in various parts of the world, South China Sea and, and so forth. And so we have a situation where, you know, we've been at war for 20 years, we're tired, we want to focus on, on uh, China, we want to rebuild our uh, nuclear triad of missiles like that, the successor to it. We want to rebuild our strike aircraft that deliver those, uh, our submarines. It's going to cost billions of dollars, billions of dollars to do that. And then what's complicating that even more is what, you know, what we're referring to nowadays as climate change. Why, when I talk about all of this other stuff, would I talk about climate change being a threat? Well, this is why. I've seen it, and I've seen the results, and it's only going to get more threatening. Now, what am I talking about? Well, let's talk about it in two different categories. The first category is, let's talk external. Okay. I, I've had the good fortune to, to stay involved in uh, uh, national security. Uh, I, I uh, uh, am a member of uh, an organization, uh, several organizations that deal with advocating for our national security. Uh, and that has allowed me uh, to travel around the world. Um, I started going to the Lake Chad Basin, for instance, uh, in the early 90s when I was in UCOM, uh, they said, you know, Sid Castillo, if it was a, a very, uh, you know, sort of remote location, uh, you know, Castillo, you know, he's a country boy, he'll do all right, send him down there. So I went to Lake Chad and uh, the basin there, and it's a lake in western uh, part of Africa, and it is an example of how climate change is impacting security. You've got uh, mostly herdsmen that are Muslims in the northern part of the Lake Chad Basin. You had 200,000 fishermen on the lake itself, and you had farmers in the south. The desert's coming south at about a mile a year, and what it's doing is pushing those herdsmen south into the area where the farmers are, okay? And they're taking their cows and they're trampling the corn. And so that's making the farmers mad. And on top of that, I flew over Lake Chad and it, you know, in the 20 years or so I've been going there, it's just amazing how it's reduced. It's not only climate change redu reduced uh, rain, but it's also misuse. But anyway, it's, the impact is there push the fishermen off the lake, and so now they're adding another layer of conflict to it. They're fighting each other, and what happens? You have Boko Haram, which is a terrorist organization aligned with Al-Qaeda and, and many of the others that are taking advantage of that chaos, advantage of the lack of confidence in government, concern with being able to feed their families, and you have a hotbed where they eventually it impacts our diplomacy, it impacts us economically, uh, and it impacts us militarily because we've already lost the most precious treasure we have as Americans, and that's the blood of our men and women who served. We've lost people killed uh, in providing security in that area. Uh, you know, I also had the opportunity to, to go to Djibouti, which is in the Horn of Africa. Uh, you go out into the uh, hinterland there, uh, and it's already uh, desolate. Uh, the people live uh, the economy is based on goats. You have uh, goat herds and, you know, the amount of milk and the amount of offspring from the goats, you know, is what gives the uh, uh, wealth to the people. 
and the most effective organization, military organization that we employed there was a uh, well drillers detachment from Guam and a veterinarian from Georgia. I don't know how they were able to talk to each other, but they did. And why? Okay, because the women in the uh, village were responsible for getting the water every day. And if you take a well drilling team and you drill a well closer to the village where mama doesn't have to walk as far to get the water twice a day, then you know that if, you know, mama feels better, everybody does. And if you take that Georgia veterinarian and you vaccinate those goats, then they have less uh, deaths during birth. More of them are produced, they do better, and you increase the wealth, and you underlie the uh, confidence in the government, and you reduce the requirement for us to be eventually involved uh, militarily. And so that is two ways that you know, climate change is impacting us externally. The third one is the Arctic. Who wants to go to the Arctic? Well, a lot of people. The United States Army right now is training brigades with the focus of going and operating in the Arctic area. Why are they doing that? Well, as the Arctic thaws, you have access to more of the resources that are up there. And everyone wants resources. Do you remember uh, the, you know, the little flail about President Trump in Greenland? Uh, that's an example of, of the motivation of, of behind it, is that resources are becoming more available to reach and because of that, you're starting to see the Russians develop additional uh, areas of uh, interest, uh, building new bases, uh, putting ships into the area. They had it highlighted uh, within the last three weeks of two nuclear submarines surfacing at the North Pole. Uh, so whenever you get us, the Russians, the Chinese, the Norwegians, uh, all the other countries in there that have economic interests or want to, to pursue them, then you have the opportunity uh, for conflict between that. So that's why another way that climate change is impacting uh, our security. And, and again, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, I, I was chief of staff of uh, the U.S. Central Command. Uh, uh, headquarters was in Tampa. The Ford headquarters was in in Byron, or in Byron, or in uh, Cutter, and uh, once a month I'd either go there or come back. And uh, uh, how I went was, you know, that my boss had his own airplane, but you know, I I hitchhiked, uh, and I'd get into a, uh, a United aircraft, and uh, they'd put me in the back of the bus going across uh, the Atlantic, and I'd get to uh, Heathrow in London, and I have a six-hour uh, layover, and it was usually six o'clock in the morning, and I'd go to TGI Fridays there at the airport and have beer and ribs to get ready for the flight to to Cutter, like that. But you know, I I did the polar route flying, and you know, over the years of doing that, you can see the impact again as uh, and you know things thaw up a little bit, uh, the reduction in the uh, ice over uh, Greenland and uh, more uh, uh, icebergs uh, in the waterways on doing that. So that's the external. And, and oh, one more, I got to talk about coagulin. Uh, in World War II, coagulin atoll was the site of a, a big battle, uh, Army and Marines and so forth. And, and now what we have it for, it's a big atoll and uh, we shoot missiles into the center of it. We've got a bunch of uh, installations around it, and uh, we do uh, 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 measurements and all of rockets and warheads that we shoot into the Pacific. And so I had the opportunity there to refuel 
on going in and out. And, and I got to tell you, you know, I like to play golf and all. And, and uh, they've got a great golf course. Uh, you do nine holes on Kowajaline. And then you uh, get on an airplane and fly an hour to the back nine, which is on Roy Namur, about 100 miles away. But that's how it goes. But what's happening is, as the sea level rises, it is threatening those installations and the people that live there. I mean, you can see it. You can see the water rise. You can see what the difference is, is making on it. And, and eventually, we may lose those installations, and the people may have to find a new place to live. Okay? That's external. Let's look ex internal here just for a little bit. I'm not competing with a helicopter anymore, am I? Okay, good. You know, big deal, a helicopter come in and land and take off. Uh, uh, but the, the internal is Norfolk. When's the last time you were in Norfolk? 15 years ago. 15 years ago. Well, I ate. The best they can do. Marine, it took six and a half million dollars from me. That's right. One of the things that I did, you know, I, I, I told you I went to UT Martin. Uh, my last job in the Marine Corps, I was head of Marine Aviation, and then my last job in the Marine Corps, they made me the, essentially the CFO of the Marine Corps. Uh, I was responsible for, uh, for putting together, defending on the, within the Pentagon and over on the Hill, $35 billion a program. And, uh, you know, only the Marine Corps would do that. I could never pass accounting 101 at Martin, and I tried three times. <laughs> but, you know, when you got $35 billion, you know, you can just make some mistakes, right? <laughs> so I did. But anyway, but you talk about Norfolk, and we've got some sailors down here that could tell you more about it. Norfolk has two problems. <laughs> First, the sea level is rising, and the second, they're pumping all the water out for the communities, and so the land is subsiding. We have billions of dollars invested in the military facilities in Norfolk, and they are under risk uh, because the climate change is, is causing the, the oceans to rise and human use is and misuse and North Carolina and Virginia have been fighting over the river there for years uh, is uh, pumping the water out uh, but we're going to have to do something about it and then I uh, going back to spending money in the Marine Corps uh, Beaufort South Carolina uh, there's two installations down there one is is the recruit depot Paris Island which everybody knows about just about and the other is Beaufort Marine Corps Air Station and we, uh, under my supervision, unfortunately, uh, we, we put $750 million into Buford. Okay. If you look at the uh, flooding area now, that $750 million that we put into Buford is under risk because as hurricanes get more intensive, as the rain uh, gets more impressive, then those facilities are under risk. And we're putting our premier aircraft in there, the F-35, uh, which costs a hundred and some odd million dollars a piece uh, into there. Uh, so that is going to be something that we're going to have to deal with in the future. And again, it's under, uh, it's risk uh, because of the of climate change. <laughs> Paris Island itself is, has to be evacuated more often uh, because of storms. You know, we've got a bunch of troops there, men and women who are training to become Marines, uh, have to be evacuated because uh, of the danger of being trapped on Paris Island when the uh, wind or when the rains come in from the hurricanes and so forth. Now, let's get a little bit closer to home. You know, I've got Park Swells down here, Tennessee Soybean Association. Uh, what we're starting to see from 
such reactionary magazines as Progressive Farmer and Successful Farmer and the Farm Journal is every month they talk about the uh, more uh, extensive storms that we're getting and the need for uh, seeds that at one time can be resistant to drought and at the same time resistance to excessive moisture. Uh, the uh, seasons are getting longer uh, for, uh, uh, for growing, uh, which has an impact on what seed you, sh you choose, how you uh, manage it. Uh, you know, South Dakota now is growing corn and soybeans, where in the past it only grew wheat because the line of, uh, of the seasons is moving, moving north. Uh, so we're seeing the impact on, on uh, food security. Uh, and that, uh, of course, is when I was talking about overseas, is one of the big reasons you see people move and uh, move into uh, to press, put pressure on the population in in uh, Europe, uh, and we're seeing it here in the South America. People uh, are pressure on uh, refugees moving out of South America. So, the bottom line overall is uh, climate change is impacting our national security. It's impacting uh, the, our diplomacy. Uh, our uh, security uh, overseas and also here in the United States. So what can we do about it? Well, you know, I'm, I'm a farmer uh, at heart. You know, I, uh, some of you heard me say this several times, you know, uh, uh, my degree is in agriculture. I graduated from UT Martin. Uh, I intended to be a farmer. Uh, when I asked Wanda to marry me, I said, honey, three years and we're back on the farm. We stayed in for 36 years. Uh, we finally got back there, but that's, that's where my heart is. Okay. We cannot, we cannot always default to the military uh, to defend this great nation of ours. We gotta bring all the resources that we have into play in order uh, to protect us. Uh, we only ought to use the military as a last resort to send them in. And you saw that yesterday as you talked, I heard the, uh, the panel, the Vietnam panel talk. Uh, if, you, if you didn't see that, you ought to go on the YouTube channel and, and uh, listen to those folks talking about the impact that it's had on their lives. We don't want our youth to go to war unless it's absolutely necessary. So that means we want to use all of the assets, all the strength of this great nation, you know, diplomatic and economic. Uh, when I go out and talk, uh, I try to come up with examples of where we're making a difference. And I, you know, I talked about parks a while ago. You know, American Soybean Association uh, is working overseas with uh, with countries, and, and I, you know, I, I testified before the Senate one time, and I talked about uh, uh, the soybeans and chickens. Uh, one other thing in Ghana, the Soybean Association has a program where they're helping teach uh, the farmers in Ghana how to raise chickens, how to manage uh, their uh, uh, nutrients. Uh, how to make sure uh, that they have logistics that uh, get them to where they need to go to market. And what that does is that strengthens uh, the country of Ghana. It makes it more durable, and it also provides a market for our soybeans. And so that's sort of a win-win for Ghana and for the United States and for the farmers here in Obine County and Crockett County and the other places. Uh, so that is one of the ways that we can do it. The other way, and it, you know, many farmers have been trying to do this for a long time, uh, and that's change how we, how we farm. Uh, you know, 
a lot of plowing when I was uh, uh, doing farming in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you know, fence row to fence row, cotton, cotton, cotton. You know, my, my farm that I live on, uh, uh, that has uh, been in my family for about 100 years now, uh, was 50 years straight in cotton. And it's a hill farm and, you know, erosion and all the good stuff. And so what we have an opportunity in agriculture is to go to regenerative agriculture. And it, what it means is, is that we look at using uh, crop rotation. We minimize disturbing the soil. Uh, no till, minimum till. We use cover crops. And we do a better job of not allowing the release of carbon into the atmosphere. On the other side, by using those practices, we're also bringing CO2, uh, greenhouse gases and others, out of the atmosphere into the soil. The greatest opportunity we have to reduce greenhouse gases and reduce the impact of climate change on the environment is with the farmers in America right now. And we can do it by using those practices and the results of that is better production, uh, increasing uh, the revenue line to carbon credits, and at the same time, uh, strengthen our, our great nation. Uh, so it, that is just as much as that brigade going to the Arctic is adopting practices like that is going to support uh, the security of, of the United States. Now I'm going to stop warbling right now. You know, I, it's always good to talk to, to Southerners. You know, I, I, uh, they were talking to Eddie Bevel yesterday. Uh, both of us uh, did service in, uh, in Bosnia and the Balkans. Uh, when the Soviet Union uh, came apart, uh, and, you know, I told you I was sending all the food supplies and medicine to the former Soviet Union. Uh, Yugoslavia came apart, and I went down there to, to uh, do relief supplies uh, into the enclaves and, and so forth. And I went to Zagreb, Croatia, as a part of that. And uh, a group of us went out one night and uh, there was about five or six of us, and I was a junior guy, and so the junior guys got to, you know, do all the work. And so we were looking for a restaurant, and uh, got lost. And I grabbed this guy walking down the street. I said, hey, can you tell me how to get to the Zagreb restaurant? He looks at me and said, eh. And, of course, you know, as an American, all you do is you just, talk louder. I said, can you tell me how to get to the Zagreb restaurant? Ah! And I got a little louder the third time, and finally he grabs me and shakes me. He says, speak English! <laughs> so I think most of you can understand me. Okay. Is there any questions that I might be able Yes, sir. How much did the American military contribute to the collapse of the Soviet Union? Everybody hear that? How much did the American military contribute to the collapse of the Soviet Union? You know, I got to tell you, from the day I went in, my focus was on fighting the Soviets. Anything else was a, uh, a distraction. Uh, we tried to uh, uh, contest them at every location. You know, we, we fought the uh, uh, Korean War because we thought, you know, that it was a, uh, a contest between us and the, and the communists. Uh, we certainly fought Vietnam because of a uh, domino theory at the time. 
Uh, we built that ICBM out there and the submarines and all these stuff, the B-52s at Blavel, all to do that. In the end, I think that we just outspent them. As our economy uh, was stronger uh, and our economic power eventually overwhelming. Uh, we checkmate them with uh, our military power, uh, but the decisive factor was not the military. It was our economic power. And, you know, I've, I've been to Cuba, Rwanda, uh, you know, Asian countries, uh, Federated Republic of Micronesia, uh, and one of the things that always, always is prevalent is our culture. We have an overwhelming culture. Uh, and uh, it distresses me sometimes uh, when we, you know, do not, do not use that as part of our uh, power tools is that we can really influence people by who we are and what we believe in. And I, I, and I gotta tell you that I am, I am so depressed nowadays. Uh, you know, when I turn on the TV and I read newspapers, I hear, take them out, take no prisoners. We're not talking about the Russians. We're not talking about the Chinese. We're talking about each other. When we talk about what we're facing uh, today, uh, and I think back about, you know, my family's been here for 300 years, 100 years in North Carolina, 200 years here in Tennessee, and I think about the years leading up to the actual formation of our country and the struggle for our independence. And I think about the Civil War. Didn't we learn something when we fought each other then? And I think about the Civil Rights Movement. Didn't we learn something then? Why are we fighting each other now when we have so many challenges that we have to face? The Chinese, the Russians, the terrorists, the climate. We can't do it unless we're united. Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you think is one of the biggest challenges to um, farming the way you're talking about? Uh, Commander Braddock asked, what is the, one of the biggest challenges to, uh, to farming the way that I, I described? Uh, <laughs> I was reading an article, you know, I, I, I love, you know, Progressive Farmer. You know, it's a, as I said, it's a really uh, radical magazine. Uh, but they were talking about uh, individual, uh, and then <laughs> in the uh, 1960s, and uh, uh, this individual uh, was pushing an idea about uh, no-till as a conservation measure, and. Uh, what it described is, is, is something like this. You know, you always have about 10% of whatever community you're dealing with that's, you know, ready to innovate and adopt new stuff, you know. That's what they're looking for. They want to be the first uh, to, to, um, 
to move out with something that seems to make a lot of sense and, and uh, be better for everybody. And then you got another 20 or 30 percent that are sort of early adopters. Once they see that things are sort of working, then they'll go, go along with it. And, and so you, about the time you get 30 or 40 percent, then you get, uh, you know, a chain reaction and you can't stop. It starts happening. And that's what happened with, uh, with no-till. And I mean, you know, it's, uh, here in West Tennessee, uh, you know, very little of anything but no-till is being used. And it's getting widely adopted across the nation because it makes sense uh, to do that. So, uh, you know, I, there's uh, several farmers around here, and it's a group, about 22 to 26 of them, uh, Matt Griggs is one of them, uh, and a few other people. Matt's another Crockett County farmer and so forth. And so, you know, they've got together and they've created this loose organization where that they've developed a, a center of excellence. And, they, you know, they look for ways to promote adopting this and promote using it and so forth. So, so where we are now is, you know, I think is, you know, we're, we're at about you know, 10% on the, the full money on regenerative agriculture. But we're starting to pull in those early adopters, and, and so we're eventually, you know, in a few years going to get it. What is, may accelerate that is, you know, that you're, you're starting to see General Mills, Cargill, uh, all of these big agriculture companies provide incentives for farmers to take that on. And so when you get those big guys doing that, then that will help speed it on and adoption, I think, will accelerate. Thank you. Any? Yes, sir. Why is our so-called yo-yo effect with in the Paris Accords, out of the Paris Accords, in, what has that done, not the merits of the Paris uh, Accords, but our ability for our allies to trust what we're going to do next? The United States role when we are at our best is when we're leading. When we're leading. Uh, when there is doubt in our leadership, there is an uncertainty that pervades international relations. There's a lack of confidence in that particular, whatever it is. And so what, what we saw with this yo-yo on this was particularly hurtful, I think. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, on uh, uh, nuclear weapons treaty, uh, New START, uh, with the Russians. Uh, it was very uh, disappointing uh, to see some of that fall up. Uh, I worked on the, uh, the Iran agreement, Jikpoa. Uh, not perfect, wasn't uh, what we wanted it to be. Uh, but it, you know, many of us felt it was working to reduce the, uh, uh, the rapidity of, of Iran developing the nuclear weapon. Uh, so I think we're all hoping uh, that, uh, that we're entering an era uh, where we can reestablish bipartisanship and that we can, as a nation, uh, move forward uh, more unified so that the rest of the world, those who are our friends and those who would wish us ill, understand where we are and that they do not have any doubts about our obligation and devotion to any particular uh, policy. Thank you. Anything else, please? Yes, sir. I always like to hear something from a soldier. Golly, Bill, you know. You know, when I was in, uh, in Bosnia, you know, the only thing that kept me going were uh, 
three soldiers, you know, that prop me up all the time. So, Hua. Hua, yeah. <laughs> uh, Hua, yeah. I have uh, two questions. Uh, one, are farmers going to be able to afford the technology to make the changes that are needed? And the second one is there's talks about lowering the inheritance level, which could make it a lot more difficult to pass farms on within a family. Uh, the uh, technology, and uh, Colonel Artis Porter is back there, and, it, and this gives us an opportunity to talk about this program. Uh, Colonel Porter is a uh, retired full bird colonel that uh, uh, is heading up a program called VETSA, and uh, we may have some University of Tennessee Martin folks here. Uh, they're part of it. Case IH is a part of it. My little company, Farm Space, is a, is a part of it. Uh, th about 13 of us in it. And it's a USDA grant that uh, about a million dollars, I think, is what it is to start with. And, uh, you know, when I came back uh, from uh, the Marine Corps, came back uh, to Tennessee, my transition job was with a... Uh, a uh, company that had a 10,000 acre farming operation uh, down here in the Mississippi Bottoms. And uh, you know, I was always a John Deere guy and they were Case IHs. And so I said, hey, you know, why don't you try a little green here? So I uh, arranged to have a demonstration of farm equipment with, uh, with a John Deere dealer. And uh, so they had it all out there and uh, you know, one of the things they had was a sprayer, you know, 120 foot boom. And I got in that thing, you know, and I sat down in it, and it was like getting in the cockpit of my airplane, except it had more computing power. It had screens and auto steer, GPS, links back to the head shed, telling how much fuel it had in it, where it was. I mean, just. Technology was something, okay? I wish I'd had it in my airplane, you know? But I had it there. And, the, and I've uh, subscribed on Facebook to a, to a group of folks that the subject is planters. You know, corn planter, cotton planter, and all that. And, hear them talking about the technology that's there. I mean, and you see the cabs and you all the screens and, and what they're doing and so forth. I mean, the technology that's required. So that's why, you know, Discovery Park is important. That's why Colonel Porter and VETSA is important. It's, we've got all these veterans that have learned this kind of technology and we want them to come back to the community because that guy that owns that planter that, you know, the, the pressure on the, uh, uh, the planter unit is not what it's supposed to be, you know. If he can't fix it, he's just going to, that $500,000 planter, turn the switch off and plant like I did, you know. Just same thing all over the field. So that, these two institutions are two ways that we're going to get that technology taken care of and at the same time increase, uh, you know, the economy of this area, but it's got to be, you got to pay for it. I mean, this is important. When you got a $500,000 planner, you're going to have to have somebody that knows what they're doing to program it and work on it. Okay. Now, I'm not a tax man. I am trying to read up on that because I know that's a sore point, okay, is the, the taxes. You know, it always is, you know. So, you know, we had the Republicans in, things were low taxes, Democrats in, taxes are going up. I got to know more about that, and I can't give you a good answer on that. All right, I got time for one more question. Yes, sir. The military doing to reduce its uh, greenhouse gas emissions? Oh, thank you for asking that, you know. What is the military doing for reducing the gas, or greenhouse gases, you know? I tell you what, you know, we all have epiphanies, you know? And my epiphany about climate change and energy and all that, I was on Haditha Dam in western Iraq and I was looking down 
the uh, Euphrates River. And, uh, you know, I went to church at Barker Chapel Baptist Church near Murray Junction, Tennessee. And in Sunday school, they had a picture, uh, you know, of uh, the River Jordan in a valley. And that's how it was there in the Euphrates. You stand up on a dam and look down there, and it's like looking at the River Jordan. And I was watching a, a column of Marines come in uh, with Humvees, and all of a sudden, one of the biggest explosions I've ever seen goes off. An IED cooks off and hits the column and so forth. You know, seven out of ten of those columns were carrying gas. It became a risk and a vulnerability. You know, my good friend uh, Jim Mattis calls it, uh, you know, get rid of the tether to fuel uh, as he was on his way to Baghdad. Uh, so that started me looking at this, okay? So we, the Department of Defense, is the largest single user of fuel. And so the Army has been one of the leaders in it, net zero installations, okay? If you go to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, over in the Ozarks, and we're all Marine and Army truck drivers go. They teach you how to drive vehicles and without, you know, excessive use of fuel. When we bind stuff now, one of the considerations we have to have in the programmatics is what is the fuel cost going to be? What's the impact on what we're using now? And we have experiment again with using biofuels uh, for the uh, for the vehicles we do have. Electricity is running a hell of a lot more things than we used to. Uh, uh, we're, we've experimented with a green fleet in the Navy uh, using alternative fuels on doing that. So uh, uh, the military is has not slowed up in uh, seeking ways to reduce uh, turning liquid into gas uh, in the fossil fuel round. Mr. Parks. Could you explain what you're doing in drones? <laughs> drones. Uh, but it, thank you, Parks. It gives me a chance to crow a little bit. Uh, the uh, Department of Homeland Security this week just announced that our little company, Farm Space Systems, in uh, Crockett County, Tennessee, uh, was awarded a contract, and, it's, <laughs> and this came from our work with, uh, with drones because it's about sensors. Uh, we are developing a capability for a non-invasive, and that means, you know, we're not going to poke you or anything, uh, to identify viruses in your breath using sensors that we're uh, developing to use on drones. Uh, and we're pretty proud of that and hopefully we'll be successful. We're in partnership uh, with the University of Tennessee uh, Health Science Centers in Memphis, the Regional Biomedical Lab, the Center for Informatics, uh, and the School of Medicine. Uh, and we've been working on this for about a year and so this is a big deal for us to take that hyperspectral sensor and put it in a booth like you see in, a, in an airport and you walk through that booth and it takes an image of your breath uh, and it, uh, it can, uh, we're projected it will, we're gonna prove it here in, in uh, a couple of months, identify your uh, virus in your breath uh, so that you don't, you know, if you wanna open uh, up a stadium and you wanna make sure somebody doesn't go in there with, uh, with the COVID, uh, you go through that first. But the basis for that was uh, we've been operating drones, and we said, hey, you know, uh, one of the things that, that we can measure also with this hyperspectral is, uh, you know, plant health. You know, we can fly over a plant, and we can uh, say, ah, it's not doing so well, you know, maybe some def uh, deficiency in uh, nitrogen or phosphorus or some of those areas uh, that can help us tell, tell that. We can count the number of plants, okay? You go in there and you plant a field, and uh, so you want to uh, you know, what, do I need to plant over again? You know, I planted, uh, you know, this many plants, and 80% of them 
uh, came up, is that good enough? You know, make decisions like that. And then the uh, last thing, and this goes into regenerative agriculture is, is that uh, we believe that we can take a drone, put a hyperspectral sensor on it, fly over soil and measure the amount of soil carbon in it. So what that does is, okay, you go out there and you measure it, and, uh, and then you tell uh, Microsoft um, he wants to buy you know, a certain amount of carbon credits. Uh, you put a, a, a ton and a half per year, per acre, or whatever it's going to be, and he's going to pay you for that, and you measure it using those sensors. So that's what we've been doing. And that's why <laughs> you know, it's in our economic interest that uh, the kids that are coming through today get interested in that kind of stuff help us develop that technology. We've taken two interns from the University of Tennessee at Martin, and that's what their kind of stuff that they're doing. Been a great, uh, great opportunity to talk with you. I'm going to have to close now. Um, it is always, always deeply felt uh, that you'd come out and listen to this old farmer from Crockett County. Uh, I really appreciate it. But if I leave you with anything, you know, is that we are one nation. For all of our existence, we've had to fight for survival, but we've always done it together. And now's the time to come back together as a country and fight the real enemy. Thank you very much.